Hello, uh, this is Virginia from the Yellow Farm, and today I wanted to talk to you about how to knit your locks in to make something long and fabulous, which is this something like this locks collar. There. Okay. This is a close up of uh, some Wensleydale locks that I knit directly into my work to see made a locks collar out of it that uh, really makes quite a statement. Um, you can see the texture of the locks and the the way the, the natural curl just plays on that is just uh, kind of spectacular. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Very, very simple. Um, no spinning uh, at This all. is the back of my locks collar that I knit. It's just knit with a plain DK yarn and then the locks are allowed to hang out and if I turn it over you can see what it looks like on the front side it looks kind of like uh, it's shearling or um, sheepskin but of course it isn't it's just knit with these beautiful long locks uh, I did not use a tail spun yarn you could uh, purchase a tail spun yarn and then just knit that directly into something that looks like this uh, but I'm going to show you today how to make something like this simply by knitting each of these locks in to your work. And it makes a, a beautiful collar, makes kind of an interesting cuff. Uh, anything that you put it on would be um, really kind of striking, certainly would make a statement. So let me show you how you do it. Here are the uh, locks we're going to be working with today. These are uh, Teeswater locks, and they're from our lambs this year. Uh, they've been washed and they've been separated and dried flat so that they're very easy to work with so when you go to take one out you can see it's kind of separated already it's nice and clean and it's ready to add into your work. Now if you buy a raw fleece you have to do some of this work yourself. Uh, very easy to wash the uh, fiber um, and then as it's drying, as you as you lay it out to dry, you just kind of individually work with the locks. Uh, if you're looking for a fleece to do this kind of technique with, you certainly want to find one that has a very, very strong lock structure uh, so that all these individual pieces do come out by themselves. Uh, if you have a different type of fleece, even within our breeds, the Wensleydale and the Teeswater, sometimes you get a fleece that the lock structure is beautiful, but it doesn't lend itself to this particular technique as well. It might be better uh, done as a lock spun or a tail spun. Um, so, you know, depending on what you're going to do with your fleece, look look and choose for the, the type that's going to suit the purpose that you're going to work with. So this is what we're working with today. I like to I like to lay them across my leg because I find that's easier to work with. And for this collar, I'm going to be using, you know, kind of a medium amount of, of locks. Each lock, you see, sometimes you get a, a lock that's kind of large and clumpy. And to make your locks last a little bit longer and go a little bit further, you can separate them by just opening them up a little bit like this and then giving them a tug. Okay, and then just laying them back down again. Uh, and that way you'll have a little bit more to use when, when you're knitting. So what I've done here is I've, I'm using a size 5 needle that's fairly small, but I want this particular piece to, uh, to have an awful lot of locks in it. It's going to make it very, very full. Uh, you can go up to a much larger needle, and I'm using a DK. Um, it happen, happens to be a yellow farm DK, but you could use almost any yarn you wanted to. And I'm using the same color, the white. Uh, because I find that that's attractive. Now you can use, for your work, you can use uh, a dyed lock, a, a natural colored lock, um, anything you want really. Uh, so I'm going to start this work. I've cast on my stitches and I'm going to knit the first stitch. I like to do that just to make sure that the end is in place. Now I'm going to take a lock. Here's a nice one. And I like, because this is a hoggett fleece, this is a, a first cut, you can identify one end it has a little tiny curls on it and the other end is blunt cut and I like the curly end to be dangling so I'm going to take the blunt end in my fingers 
and I'm going to lay it between my stitches. I've knit one and I'm just laying it between and I'm going to allow a little of that tail to hang out so that I can carry it with, whoops, so I can carry it with my work. Let's get that stitch back on. That was sloppy. Um, okay. So I'm carrying, taking these, this little bit of tail, I'm carrying it with my yarn, and I'm going to knit two stitches with just this tail and allow the rest of this lock to dangle. Okay, so I'm just simply knitting one and knitting a second, and I'm taking the tail with me and locking it in. Okay, it's really a, a variation of a thrum. Uh, thrumming has been around forever. Uh, and was used, let's just do another one while I'm talking here, let's grab a nice lock, see if we can find a good one here. I'm going to identify again the end that I'd like to be hanging down from my work, and I like that little curly end to be hanging down. So I'm grabbing the cut end, again I'm placing it between my two needles, between a stitch, then I'm going to knit and carry just the little end along for two stitches to lock it in. Thrumming's been around for a very long time. Normally when you thrum, uh, I'm sure there are many, many variations of thrumming. Um, usually in thrumming, your, your fiber is left to the inside to insulate and soften or even waterproof in some cases, uh, mittens and, and articles like that. But because the Wensleydales and the Teeswaters have such a, an amazing fiber, you certainly wouldn't want to hide it on the inside. So this way you can allow it to dangle on the outside. Again, I'm adding a stitch, but laying it between my needles, between two stitches, taking the little tail, carrying it along, just that one little tail, carrying it along with my yarn that I'm working with, and I'm knitting two stitches to be sure that it's all locked in tightly. And as you can see, if I tug on this now, See how those are just dangling down? But they are really well locked in. Um, and they're going to hang down and make the edge of my collar. Uh, so I'm going to finish this row by adding locks as I go. And as you see, this one is kind of bulky. Now you could put that in if that's the look you're going for. You could certainly do that. I'm going to split it, though. I might even split it twice. I think I will. So I want this collar to be somewhat delicate. Uh, and not quite so chunky. And there will be an awful lot of locks in this work by the time we're done. So uh, you can afford to go slowly and add thin locks as you go because as they build up in layers, they will get um, much thicker and make much more of a statement. So again, I'm just taking the tail, carrying it along for two stitches. It's very, very simple. Um, other thrumming techniques sometimes involve laying the fiber, bending it in half, and laying it. You could do that with this fiber. However, I think, that's the wrong end. I think because our, the fiber of sheep that we have, the Wensleydales and the Teeswaters particularly, are very silky uh, and can be very slippery. And I find that if you just double it, and bend it around as in a traditional thrum, uh, it can sometimes slip, be slipped out if you pull tug hard at it. Now, you know, you could try that and bend it around instead of letting it just hang this way. Uh, and if it works for you, terrific. I mean, the whole idea is you get to do exactly what you want to with these locks. You also could be adding these locks in in different colors. Um, you could add, again, I'm just going to place the lock between my stitches, carry the little tail over. Uh, you could be using different colors as you work. You can be using a shorter lock and then a longer lock uh, to create a different kind of a look. Uh, but that's a, a, as simple as it is. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue adding a lock and knitting the little tail in for two stitches so it's really in there. And then I'm going to knit back. So without adding locks, because I find if I add locks on the way back, it, my work is so thick and so heavy. But again, that's my taste. And what I'm looking for, you might be looking for something different. So I'll show you what this looks like when I've worked on it a little bit more. So here I am choosing a lock, laying it between my two stitches, between my two needles, grabbing the little piece in back. 
and I'm going to knit two. One, two. Simple as that. You just continue like that. You can see how that's building up another row of locks and eventually you'll have one of those nice locks collars or you'll have something that you can put on the edge of a sweater, on your sleeve edge, or really anything you want. The whole point is just to be able to get a little more creative about how we're using these locks. Now you could use a different type of uh, a different type of lock for this. You'd get a totally different look uh, and because um, here at the Yellow Farm we breed Teeswaters and Wensleydales, uh, we like to promote their particular fiber and it is uh, it really lends itself beautifully for, to this kind of work because of the, the lock structure that it has and also because of the sheen. I don't know if you can see that sheen in uh, on this video as well as you can see it in person, but the sheen and the lock structure are just beautiful in this particular type of fiber. Um, and you certainly would get a very different look from something else. The handle on uh, from these sheep is also amazing. It's very soft, very much like a, like a mohair. I've heard uh, in the UK on occasion they have called these these Luster Longwell sheep. They've called them poor man's mohair, uh, the fiber from them, and it is very much like that. It's uh, almost a little like pagora uh, as well, although certainly that's a, an amazing, beautiful fiber. Um, so you can experiment with this. Obviously this technique will work for anything, um, but this is the end product that you're going to have hanging out and you'd want to choose something that you want to see. And I want to see the Teeswater and the Wensleydale fiber, so that's the way I do it. Uh, again, there's the back. It's just uh, garter stitch. Uh, add as many as you want to. If you're going to make a collar, make it a little bit longer. If you're going to make a cuff for your sleeve or a a, uh, a bracelet, leave it shorter. Uh, so have fun and enjoy this technique. 